And fellow cabinet members, uh, councillors, um, and member of the public, um, as usual, uh, the agenda papers and public forum submissions are available on our uh, website. I need to draw your attention to the emergency evacuation procedure as well, which is being displayed on the screen and is also on your agenda. And please be aware the meeting is being webcast, so please can I remind everyone to speak into the microphone to make sure you are clearly heard by uh, those watching now at home or later. Um, uh, on specifics of today's agenda, agenda item 10, uh, the temporary accommodation update contains an exempt appendix with commercially sensitive information and any discussion on the content of this appendix will need to be held in exempt session. Uh, cabinet members have been uh, given access to this appendix. And on agenda item 11, safety valve, the chief executive and the monitoring officer have decided this item is urgent and cannot be reasonably delayed and have therefore exempted the uh, calling of the decision. And agenda item 15, uh, increase in fixed penalty notice rates for fly tipping and graffiti. That's going to take place first after the standing items uh, because uh, Councillor Bennett will need to uh, leave early today. On to agenda item two, public forum. All statements and questions will be taken at the time of the relevant agenda item uh, is being discussed and I'll reply to questions myself or I'll ask the relevant cabinet member to respond. Agenda item three, apologies for absence. We've had two from Councillors Helen Holland and Councillor Nicola Beach. Um, and obviously we have uh, Councillor Bennett leaving early. Agenda item four, declarations of interest. Any cabinet members have any interest to declare in relation to today's agenda? No. Okay, agenda item five, matters referred for consideration by scrutiny or full council. Uh, there's been no referrals for consideration by scrutiny or full council, uh, uh, but I'll mention the allotment call in at chair's business. Uh, agenda item six, reports from scrutiny commissions. There is a statement from um, OSM and Councillor Dyer is going to present this. Tony. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the scrutiny session here yesterday was a joint scrutiny session of uh, OSM and people scrutiny looking at the safety valve and it looked at both uh, cabinet papers, uh, the one that's coming today and the one that went to the, uh, the March cabinet. Um, I won't go through the entire report in detail because it, it was quite a lengthy discussion. Um, I would summarise is that concerns were raised about the nature of the embargo uh, by the DfE, which I believe you are going to address, uh, and also the level of interaction with other elected members regarding the negotiations. Um, as the resort members were concerned about the lack of information available, um, however, uh, we did cover quite a lot of ground, as, as can be uh, seen in the document. Uh, members did also express concern about the potential penalties for not hitting the very exacting targets that have been set, and also welcomed the commitment to publish the relevant KPIs, both on service and uh, financial delivery. Other items noted was the continuous need to rebuild the relationships, particularly with parents and carers, and also concerns about the tight time frame for building the new school. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that, Tony. Um, let's move on to agenda item seven, which is chair's business. Uh, first off on the allotment call-in, this is to note that the call-in committee on the 27th of March decided no further action should be taken in relation to the issues identified in the call-in, on the understanding that Councillor King and the director uh, the management of place undertook not to act on the cabinet decision that had been called in and that the decision will be referred to the future public health and communities policy committee. Uh, that committee will chart the way forward. So that'll be their decision. As it was a cabinet level decision, we wanted it noted here that the decision is not being implemented. Um, secondly, it's worth noting that this is uh, uh, our final uh, cabinet under the mayoral system. We've had almost 100 meetings, cabinet meetings since 2016. Nearly 1,100 papers have been considered. Just want to thank all the cabinet members who have been in the cabinet, past and present, and all the councillors and members of the public who've contributed 
to the discussions. Uh, I want to thank, obviously, uh, our officers who have worked hard behind the scenes to write and develop the reports and those who have then gone forward to implement the decisions uh, of, of this cabinet. So Stephen and Tim, if I can extend the thanks to the officers uh, through you as well, uh, I, I'd be uh, very grateful uh, for that. And third item in um, on today's agenda is to encourage people not to forget to register to vote and also to make sure people are fully aware that they need to show their photo ID to vote at a polling station um, uh, for our local elections and the police and crime commissioner elections. And those elections will be on Thursday, the 2nd of May. So it's really important. Make sure you're registered, make sure you take your ID, make sure your vote. And a valid photo ID includes a passport, a driving license, blue badge, an identity card, with a pass mark and uh, certain concessionary travel cards. Uh, I guess if you need a travel card, probably need to check that it's going to be a valid one. If you don't have a photo ID, you can apply for a free voter ID by 5 p.m. on Wednesday, the 24th of April. So it's worth um, uh, worth doing so, and uh, we'll push out some information as well into the public domain to make sure we have many people as voting, uh, you know, as possible. I think I need to be careful of, uh, you know, of somehow, some way, uh, being in cabinet, but obviously I'm wishing Tom and the Labour Group all the very best in those elections. Uh, standing on a fantastic record for the city. Um, and uh, this is a, as I shared over the weekend, you know, through all the ping pong that happens and uh, is sometimes passed off as meaningful political discussion. This is a 15 billion pound economy on a 42 square mile plot of land with nearly half a million people. That's going to be 550,000 within the next 26 years. You know, how we meet the challenges of meeting the needs of that growing population on a city that's been characterized by entrenched inequalities and, and fractures in the past, one that is gentrifying at a rate of knots as well as one of the least affordable core cities outside of London. These are, these are serious challenges and meeting those needs in the context of a climate and ecological uh, emergency. And dare I add to that, I've just got off the phone today with mayors from around the world um, and, uh, in, and actually members of the IPCC. Um, also the, the, the growing pressure that will be coming upon countries from the migration crisis and the political instability that could result. Uh, so uh, Bristol has played a leadership role um, in those areas um, and it's gonna take serious leadership uh, to take that forward. So I wish, I wish, uh, I wish you all the best and, and Kai and Ellie and Molly and Don uh, running again um, also. Okay, uh, now we're gonna jump out of order because Molly uh, does have another engagement as I shared. So we're going to start with agenda item 15, uh, and that's an increase in fixed penalty at notice rates for fly tipping and graffiti. Anything that increases the penalties for fly tipping and graffiti, very, very welcome. Marley. Thank you, Marvin. Um, firstly, for allowing me to bring this um, paper to the beginning of the meeting. Um, also, as it's the last cabinet meeting, I think it's only appropriate to thank you as well for all the support that you've given me personally, the, your, your service uh, to the city these past eight years. And I know how this is a priority for you politically and personally, um, keeping our, clean, our, our streets clean. I didn't quite realise when I took the cabinet role that the main person messaging me about fly tips would be yourself, but you know, <laughs> we, yeah, we, we're getting them collected and that's, that's what this paper today is, is all about. So yeah, th thank you. Um, so raising the penalties for fly tipping, fly posting and graffiti in this way sends a clear message about what is and isn't acceptable in Bristol. This is something that the vast majority of residents in Bristol will support. They understand the benefits of having clean and tidy streets, but it's them who are being let down by a small group who commit these offences. We are already investigating fly tips, installing CCTV cameras, issuing fines, seizing and even crushing vehicles used for fly tipping. 
These higher fines mean that anyone caught fly tipping will face a fine of up to a grand and we will use the proceeds to fund even more enforcement officers, which will be another tool in our arsenal to keep Bristol clean. Clearing fly tips and litter costs Bristol taxpayers about £6 million every year, against which the fines proposed today are clearly just a drop in the ocean. Illegal and unsightly graffiti, which is often just a name, a tag or an offensive slogan, continues to be a blight in the townscape. Whilst we have made progress overseeing a 19% reduction in fly tipping in the last year, env environmental crimes continue to impact our residents, and in 2023 Bristol <coughs> Waste still had to clear 9,000 fly tips and remove 67,000 square metres of graffiti. This is why we're taking this action today. The focus from today's paper will likely be on the increased penalties for those who commit these environmental offences, but I actually also want to use this as an opportunity to thank the people who do show Bristol the care that our home deserves mm. and highlight the impact of our Clean Streets campaign that launched in 2017. We want every Bristolian to take pride in our city, and last month at City Hall, Marvin, we hosted a thank you event for our fabulous Clean Street champions who operate all across the city, from Ambition Lawrence Weston in the north to the Whitchurch Wombles in the south. These volunteers make an enormous contribution. Together, they collected 3,000 refuse and recycling bags of waste. The Clean Streets also established the Big Tidy team, who have cleaned streets in every ward of our city clearing an average of 10 tonnes of waste each week, as well as tackling tagging, fly tipping and overgrown vegetation. Volunteers and the staff at Bristol Waste are too often unsung heroes, working tirelessly to keep our streets clean and safe. Bristol Waste alone clean 800 miles of streets each week, with 8,000 hours of additional street cleaning by the Big Tidy team each year. That work sit, sits alongside the contributions of Bristolians across our city, who have ensured that Bristol remains the best English core city for recycling for an eighth year running. It's clear that the vast majority of Bristolians care for where we live. We want to assure that everyone can and does take pride in keeping our city clean and tidy. That's why we're bringing the paper forward today. Thank you. Thank you, Marley. And I'm, I'm glad you were looking at my fly tip messages. <laughs> that <sounds> through. <laughs> um, yeah, it is, a, it is a pain, isn't it? Um, and I don't mean that in just an inconvenience, but actually a, a pain to the, the pride and dignity we have in Bristol when we uh, see people, uh, see the evidence of people mistreating it. Um, so let, let's go uh, to uh, public forum. We've received one public forum statement, uh, and that's from Southwest Transport Network and Sevenside, uh, David Redwell. So Dave, you have a minute, okay? Yeah, Dave? I mean, graffiti is, is, is a real, challenge and tagging in this city region um, and they say the progress we've made over the last eight years to remove as much as possible of it but we've still got an awful lot more to do working with the Avon and Somerset Police and the Police and Crime Commissioner and the British Transport Police in particular um, we still see tagging on the buildings historic buildings of the city uh, we still see tagging of course on people's front doors in, in council and uh, ten, uh, tenements which get removed or in houses that are uh, run by British City Council um, and it's unacceptable really. Um, and we've recently seen an uplift in the tagging on the buses. They're now spraying the backs of first group and stagecoach buses which is, means the buses have to go in the depot and be cleaned. They can do that. And we've got a really bad problem on the Intercity Express trains coming out of Bristol going to London across the network where I believe they're tagged in the Bedminster area. But I suppose the question, and I think the mayor's really highlighted this, and I welcome everything Marvin's done to drive this agenda because this city was appalling, and I don't mean the street art, that's fine by me, street art's fine. But tagging is something that makes the city unsafe, makes the city region unsafe, and when it spreads to Froome and Cheltenham and Gloucester and Bath, uh, we've got a problem. So my thing today is to keep pushing this with the new council, yeah. keep pushing this at a regional level with WECA, and to bring some prosecutions, and that's really what I want to see up before the courts, up before the work we do with Alex Reeks, and some of these people made to clean it off in public, because it's unacceptable in such a beautiful Dave. region. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And you, the microphone is going to stay with you, as we have two questions. Uh, the first one is from yourself. My question is, if we can get some stats 
and I appreciate I've got to be careful here, we're in the middle of a, of a local uh, police and crime commissioner election, but can we get some stats from Sarah Crewe and from the Chief Constable of BTP and Bristol Port Police as to how many people they actually put before the magistrates in Bristol, Bath or Western Supermere, Gloucester, Charlton, Taunton or Trowbridge, bearing in mind our transport network, uh, they've actually brought, to, brought before the courts and what penalties we've had and can that please be circulated to myself and the media but equally to all the councillors on the council because we need action, we need prosecution. Okay. I do welcome the work you've done, Marvin, on this personally. Thank, some thanks, that. Dave. I think Molly does have something on that, Molly. Um, I, don't, I don't have the stats to hand, but I'm happy to sort of take that away and um, hopefully get them published for you. Um, we do, as a council, obviously work closely with the police to tackle graffiti-based criminal damage. Um, just as an estimation, each individual tag that we remove, it costs us about £250. So, you know, that's a huge amount of cost if you sort of count up how many tags we, we have to remove over the course of a year and, you know, where else that funding could be going. Um, so we, we want to work with police. We also want to work, um, we do work with communities uh, to clean their areas of graffiti tagging. Um, we, as a council, don't prosecute people for graffiti-based criminal damage, which is obviously a police matter. Um, but outcomes uh, range from out-of-court disposals to conditional cautions. And as I said, we'll get the sort of full figures uh, published and over to you. Yeah, Dave, yeah. Um, it, in, in a scarce resource era as well, it does become a challenge. I mean, I'll share too, I, I, you know, I've, on my way home from work, come across a couple of people tag in on a couple of occasions and intervene myself, much to the consternation of my office. No, it wasn't there. Uh, but my line was, what they were doing wasn't very good. If you are going to graffiti, at least be good at it. You know, if you need to practice, practice in your bedroom. All right? Which is what I shared. They didn't like that. But nonetheless, yeah, we can't, you know, Bristol, the, the cleanliness of the street, we should expect more. Um, and not only does it take away from the, you know, the, the, the beauty of the, of the city, but, uh, but it costs us an awful lot of money uh, to chase after, chase after people uh, mistreating their city. And that has consequences for other areas, uh, you know, of life in the city. Okay, uh, did you have a supplementary no. I mean, it's difficult because we're, in, we're coming to a, a new council, but I would hope that the new council will take this service forward and work in a sub-regional partnership with Wecker and Gateway and the other partners to try and bring this uh, graffiti and tagging, and particularly fly tipping, because I know we work south, with South Gloucestershire very, very closely, and the other unitaries. But I think the thing is, can we just make sure that we do make sure that this is a service that Bristol Waste and the West of England provide to keep our, our, our public transport and our city safe? An unsafe city like uh, New Jersey or the Bronx makes people not want to feel safe to use our public transport network, let alone walk around the streets. Uh, and it's really unsafe, and we need to make sure that we fund this service. So it's really a handover thing to the new authority and the new authority working with our regional partners in you know, the three UAs uh, and across the city, the, the, the county of Somerset, Wiltshire. We need to well, Gloucestershire. It's a, it's a regional thing, yeah. but we've got to get on top of it, and that's so my, my supplement, really. What we'll do is we'll take that as a standing question that, that is in the air. Someone somewhere may note it down. And, but obviously you can carry it forward to future councillors as well about how much resources are going to be allocated uh, to this and how they're going to work uh, with the city to tackle it. Bearing in mind that I would just, actually before I do that, let's, let's go to Steve and, and honour that question first. Steve, let's, let's come to you now for your uh, question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and this one I'm sure you'll sent to uh, Marley as well. Um, as a former cabinet member for Waste and a former member of the Bristol Waste Company Board, I welcome the proposal to increase fly tipping fines to the legal maximum. And it was always a considerable frustration that central government wouldn't allow us to act more swiftly and more robustly. 
The government has recently changed the rules to allow councils to increase fines for littering. Would you and the cabinet member support raising fines for littering to the legal maximum too? Thanks, Steve. Yeah, um, it's, it's certainly a good point. We, as a city, spend £6 million every year on clean, 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 cleansing the city. Um, and it was another former Cabinet Member for Waste, Kai, in the role at the time, who brought forward the uh, increase in the littering offences um, just in summer last year. And I think, did you say it was three weeks later after that the government announced it could be increased further? That's right, yeah. Yeah, literally three weeks, so <laughs> uh, slightly unfortunate timing. Um, but we've, we've obviously not proposed an incre increase uh, today, but it's definitely something we'll, we'll sort of continue to review. But it'll, it'll be a decision for any future administration because littering remains a significant issue in Bristol. Um, we continue to address it, issuing fixed penalty notices. Um, so in the last year, our enforcement contractor issued almost 5,000 FPNs. Um, and betre between January and December 2023, the courts found over 300 people guilty of committing environmental crimes in Bristol. So we are catching people, and that is leading to behaviour change. Of course, the rates of the fines are something you'll, you'll review. You know, we, we can debate what, what is the appropriate sort of fine for, for littering as opposed to sort of fly tipping. I, I'd always say fly tipping is obviously a more severe offence and should have a much stiffer sentence. But, you, you know, both, both the crimes, both make our city dirty and will harm people's um, views of our city, our, our residents' views. So it's definitely a priority. Um, we also recognise that more needs to be done, um, including the communication of how we're finding people, the prosecutions and the expected behaviours uh, that we uh, want from people who are littering, um, preventing uh, bins from overflowing more frequently and keep working on improving the cleansing of our city before uh, littering FPNs are raised again. So, you know, there, there's a lot that we are doing to tackle littering already. But, yeah, it's definitely something a future administration can, can consider. Do you have a supplementary, Steve? If I had any supplementary, it would be to ask the Cabinet members if they get as many contacts about littering and fly yes. tipping and fly posting and yes. graffiti in their mailboxes as I do, which is pretty much a rhetorical question, I think. Yeah, it's always been top issue of my mailbox, I think it is for most of us. The mayor used to keep me posted as well. <laughs> Whoever gets that portfolio is on the end of my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I watch on my way in every day. It's mm -hmm. painful. Look, I mean, I just, again, for, for, the, for the sake of how we tackle it, one is um, when we came in, we did try to look at how we adjust the city's relationship with waste. You'll notice, Steve, and you'll notice, Marley, that waste shouldn't be something that we think about when we've done all the stuff. We need to put waste up front of city design. So we're thinking about with our new housing delivery, for example, thousands of homes, that's going to be lots of resource use. That inevitably is going to include some waste. We have to minimise waste at the front end, increase uh, reuse recycling, um, you know, on, on the back end, uh, you know, as well. Um, so we, we, we've, Bristol Waste, I'm pleased to say, with the current chief executives really come into city leadership now to talk not just to the council, but to the big institutions in the city, universities, health service, police, private sector, voluntary sector, because we all oversee systems that use resources and by definition generate waste within that process. So collectively taking action um, is going to be incredibly important because as we said many times, Bristol is a collective act. It's not just on the receiving end. It's not the only end of a bunch of council initiatives or policies, right? We, we create this thing together. Um, and secondly, yeah, the burning platform we are on is of a growing po uh, population in a finite land space. Uh, and so with more people living here, we'll need more economic activity, more jobs, more food, more stuff uh, for people to live. We have to crack that nut about how we have a collection of city systems that reduce the use of resource at the front end, reduce the generation of waste, and as I said, increase uh, reuse recycling on the back end whenever possible. Um, that is the, the challenge facing cities all across the world and one that we obviously 
facing here um, ourselves. Um, any cabinet members wish to comment on this item before I hand back to Marley? Kai? Yeah, thank, thanks, Marvin. And um, yeah, it is, I mean, for me, it's the, probably the number one issue I get via email from, from residents. Um, slightly different issues in my surgery, but um, yeah, so it's a massive issue in, in, in Southmead. And um, yeah, I welcome, welcome this paper, really. Um, I think it will help us provide more enforcement because it, they can be, some of the cases can be quite time consuming because they're more complicated to investigate. So we should have more money coming in to the coffers to hope, hopefully maybe have some more staff that we, we can all allocate in this direction to um, obviously carry out more investigations and more enforcement action. Um, it, I mean, it is a serious crime and we, you know, there's a number of examples of um, huge, huge fly tips across the city. Um, I think that in those cases, they're, they're, you know, they ver into more criminal type um, rather than civil matters as, as we're dealing with here today. But the irony is that if something is serious and it does go to court and they get fined by the court, we don't get any of the money. So that's, that's part of the problem as well. Let me hand back to you, Marley, but I'm sure you join me as well in just restating our thanks to Kurt James, who's led from the beginning on Clean Streets. We brought him in right at the start of this administration to work on clean streets and through Kurt as well, all the community organisations that have gone out on litter picks and regularly do so. Uh, we've got a kit out so people can do that. But, you know, as you said, we did a thank you event, uh, you know, in City Hall. And also thanks to those frontline workers uh, who are, are out cleaning, cleaning our streets. Um, you know, and I walk through uh, Old Market in the morning. I'd always see the guys out picking up and we'd have a you know quick chat about what's going on but just for those frontline workers to to let them know that they're valued and um we don't just see them as people that go around picking up our rubbish after we've moved on although that's a, in some part what they their job that's not just what they are though what they are is key to making the city uh, what the city should be and, clean, and cleaning up and i think we'd only really know their true value if they stopped doing what they were doing uh, and uh, they pick up tons of rubbish in Bristol and dispose of it properly. So, you know, a big thank you to Bristol Waste and those frontline workers. Um, Marley, let me hand back to you now to take the decision uh, which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. Thank you, Marvin. Yeah, but just, just before I do, I, I would say I, I joined Bristol Waste at their company conference earlier um, today and saw, um, you know, the, the frontline staff in this sort of all company wide um, event. And they, you know, they were being thanked by um, the, the senior team at Bristol Waste, and you know, would definitely echo that. Bristol wouldn't be what it was without their efforts, and we, you know, we all owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Um, so, for the final time, in from me, in terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thanks very much, Marley. Uh, so let's move on to agenda item eight now, single homelessness accommodation programme, SHAP, funding bid. Tom. Thank you. I bought a, a few SHAP-related papers, so it may, may sound like a bit of a broken record when I, when I go through this. Um, but just as a, a reminder, the single homelessness accommodation programme offers the opportunity to secure grant funding to increase the supply of high-quality supported accommodation, which is needed to help individuals recover from the root causes of homelessness and reduce rough sleeping in Bristol. And this accommodation would be targeted at single people who would normally be owed a full homelessness duty and would therefore provide a cost-effective alternative to privately managed unsupported temporary accommodation. Uh, the programme has been targeted at two cohorts, of single adults with a long history of rough sleeping or with complex needs, and also young people aged 18 to 25 at risk of experiencing homelessness or rough sleeping. And there's two elements to the funding as well. There's been a capital grant funding element um, to deliver additional accommodation, including blocks of supported housing or dispersed housing first units. And there's also been a revenue grant funding element to provide intensive support to tenants in the accommodation. Uh, and that's what this relates to uh, today. So um, council officers additionally encourage places for people who are currently delivering commissioned homeless accommodation in Bristol to apply to the SHAP programme for revenue grant funding to increase the level of support that they could provide uh, across 38 units of supported accommodation. That bid was done directly um, and they were successful in securing a total of £783,255 in revenue grant funding. 
Um, because they placed the bid directly, it was under, understood that any awards would be paid to them directly. However, it's since transpired um, that revenue-only grant funding must come through the local authority. Um, and so officers are seeking authority to accept and spend the above grant funding. And we're not required to contribute any funding. So it's simply passporting through and we will put monitoring arrangements in place um, to, uh, to assure ourselves around the spend of the money. Um, and, and, you know, we, we know that there's much to do to address homelessness locally and nationally. Um, I still uh, every opportunity to talk about the Kers Lake Commission to end homelessness and rough sleeping. That really does provide an effective blueprint uh, on action that we need to take to stem some of the issues from getting significantly worse. And one of the things I do welcome that has now been carried out is the rebasing of the local housing allowance rates back to the 30th percentile, uh, which will provide some help, although it was a, a one-off uh, is what has been said. So let's hope uh, a future government might decide to do something different and we, and we need to go further. And after that, I commend the report to Cabinet. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so we've had no uh, public forum statements or questions on single homelessness accommodation uh, program funding bid. Uh, but can I offer it to any cabinet members who might wish to comment? Marley. Thank you, Marvin, and yeah, thank thank you, Tom, for bringing this important paper forward. You know, obviously, it's devastating to see. You know, we continue to see people face homelessness in our city, and um, particularly off of noting the fact that now um, our end of private tenancies are such a leading cause of homelessness as well as um, not being able to be accommodated with friends or family. The only way we're going to address these issues are providing new homes and uh, new supported housing of a high quality. That's you know what we want to do as a city to, to meet the needs. Um, so any provision that we can provide, particularly these high quality supported units are much needed and can, can be commended enough, quite frankly. Thanks, Marley. And it just speaks into the ongoing housing crisis uh, we are in as well. The need to build homes in practice, not just in principle. In specific places, I, I did hear someone um, justifying opposing housing delivery because of the specifics the other day on Radio 4. I mean, all homes are built in specific places <laughs> um, in Bristol. Uh, so we need to build homes, we need to support people. Uh, also, this is about wraparound for me, wraparound support as well, as, and Tom, from my background working together pre-council, it's about bricks, mortar and a roof, isn't it? But it's also about mental health support, life support, the social support structures around people to be able to, uh, to prevent moving into homelessness, but also to transition from homelessness into settled accommodation, you know, as well. So, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, your work and uh, the work of uh, people across the wider city, across our VCS and our other public sector uh, partners um, in this area. So Tom, let me hand back to you to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. Thank you. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Okay, and in the same theme, uh, agenda item nine, homelessness prevention grant allocation top up for 24-25. Yeah, so we continue to see rising rates of, of homelessness and it remains a hugely challenging issue and as, as my colleagues Marley's just mentioned that you know two of the two leading drivers of homelessness that are listed in the report and shown in the report are end of private rent tenancy which you know is often a section 21 no fault eviction um usually because the people can't or won't pay the um, rent increases because it's getting increasingly unaffordable uh, and also people no longer, are no longer able to be accommodated with friends or family and we've seen homelessness rates rise since the pandemic so since everyone in when there was a, a big increase um, it's continued to rise um, uh, and you know it's an average of 510 households a month that are now approaching Bristol City Council because of homelessness related issues which is really stark when you think about it you know it's over 6,000 a year um, the, the number of households in temporary accommodation is over 1,500 um, and you know it's, it's becoming a, an increasingly challenging picture and, and we've um, again been given some more money to help um, address it and I'll, I'll just talk through that and then just, just offer a couple of thoughts on that. Um, the autumn statement uh, in 2023 announced an additional 120 million to help councils address homelessness pressures for the coming financial year that we just moved into um, and on at the end of February uh, England share of that was announced as 109 million and Bristol City Council were to be allocated 987,000 720 pounds um, which is ring fence for use in the 2024-25 year and must be spent in line with the homelessness prevention grant principles uh, which are to comply fully with the homelessness reduction act and contribute to ending rough sleeping by increasing activity to prevent single homelessness 
to ensure the financial viability of services by contributing to the cost of statutory duties, including implementing the Homelessness Reduction Act and supporting with the cost of temporary accommodation, and to reduce family temporary accommodation numbers through maximising family homelessness prevention and reduce the use of unsuitable B&Bs for families. Um, you know, I think we obviously welcome any funding that is going to be given by central government, but I think you know, the one thing I would say is I'd rather like the, sim the, the issues were dealt with, that these are the symptoms of, so we can use funding far more effectively. You know, we need to see renters reform get through the House of Commons and the House of Lords, um, which has been significantly delayed. And we've been promising that since Theresa May was Prime Minister, so that's how far back uh, you got to go. It's a few Prime Ministers ago. Um, and, you know, to, if that's the only way we're really going to get on top of this stuff is through renters reform and really getting on top of the cost of accommodation. So whilst this is welcomed as a bit of help, um, it's, it's literally a stick in plaster and no more. I commend the report to Cabinet. Thank you, Tom. Um, so on this item, we've had no public forum statements or question on the Homelessness Prevention Grant allocation top-up. Uh, uh, can I offer it to any Cabinet members who might wish to comment on this item before going back to Tom? Craig? I will, yeah. I, I mean, I, we'll, we'll talk about it again on the next paper as well. Timber accommodation and homelessness are driving costs into every council in the country at a staggering rate, like a, a really terrifying rate. If you look at the overspends that are happening across the country, they are driven by adult social care, child social care and temporary accommodation. And um, if we don't grasp the nettle on this problem as a nation, I don't know where, where it ends, and it's a symptom of letting the market decide when it comes to housing. And the market has decided that it doesn't really care about social outcomes, it only really cares about profit. And that has inevitably driven this horrendous situation that we find ourselves in, particularly bad in Bristol because house prices are so, are so high here and that, that just um, creates more subsidy loss for the council but also is you know, driving homelessness in the first place through the no fault evictions that you mentioned just now. Um, so anything we could do to help is good. As Tom said, it is a bit of a stick in plaster and similarly the next paper, you know, we'll, we'll look at what we're doing in Bristol. We'll be bringing on some more accommodation. Um, is it enough? No chance. And, and how, we, how we find enough, I don't know. Um, anyway, thanks for all your work on it, Tom, and, and good luck in the future. Thanks, Greg. And I, and I think you just picked up a couple of things there, Tom, that was on my mind. It, what we would want is systemic fixing, fix the system, and let's have a long-term plan, uh, rather than this short-term, here's a funding pot to, you know, get you through the next crisis that is continually coming our way because of systemic failures in both housing delivery and housing management. I mean, in the UK, it's been a point the LGA repeatedly make is about the, the broken financial uh, model and, and relationship there is between local government and, and uh, Westminster. Uh, so uh, obviously that's a challenge that's going to continue and, and hopefully the work uh, that we do with LGA Labour as well, it's the biggest group in Labour uh, in the LGA now, Will, will continue to, to be a priority and with core cities, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 for the years to come. So, Tom, let me hand back to you now to take the decision, uh, which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Okay, so and to agenda item 10, still with you, Tom, temporary accommodation um, update. And then I'm just going to ask people to remember there is an exempt appendix to this paper, so if any Cabinet members wish to discuss its context, we'll have to move into exempt session. Tom. Thank you. So, as, as we've been saying, it remains a huge financial challenge for us um, and for councils across the country, the use of temporary accommodation. Um, the LGA says that the number of households living in temporary accommodation has risen by 89% over the past decade to over 104,000 households at the end of March 2023. That's the highest figures since records began in 1998 and costing councils at least £1.74 billion pounds in 2022-23 alone. Um, but there's also, as well as these, you know, just staggering financial costs, there's a huge toll for every individual and family that we have to play in temp uh, place in temporary accommodation. It's, you know, the disruption, the uncertainty, the impact on people's lives. You know, it, it's really, you know, it's really not easy. Um, and you know, one of the real challenges is that we have a, you know, severe shortage of social housing, which means councils are being forced to pay to house people in very expensive private temporary accommodation, including hotels, including B&Bs, while waiting for a permanent home. 
Um, and one of the things which I touched on, I think, at a previous meeting was some of the organisations making this provision available charge rates that mean there was significant subsidy loss to us as a council. Um, and there were two companies responsible for in the region of £7 million of that subsidy loss in the last financial year. Um, so clearly becoming a bit of a racket. The annual temporary accommodation subsidy loss for 24-25 is estimated to total over £17 million if no steps were taken to reduce this cost. And long, of course, long term, the solution to high numbers of households in temporary accommodation is to increase the amount of general needs, affordable homes and council homes available. So we're working with our housing revenue account and registered provider partners to identify opportunities to increase our housing stock at pace. However, in the short term, we're working on various other work streams to try and reduce our dependence on expensive private rented TA to reduce our subsidy loss. Um, and as I mentioned you know, earlier this year, there was a, an emergency summit that was organised looking at the issues of the temporary accommodation crisis and you know, very well represented rural councils, urban councils, all facing the same issues, councils of all colours, whether they're Labour run, Tory run, Lib Dem run, they're all having this issue. Um, so it can't just be put down to um, you know, how one council may be approaching the issue. It's a systemic issue. It's a national issue. Um, and we need, we need a grip on it and probably, dare I say, a Labour government to actually deal with it. Um, and, you know, really for us, we need to make sure that a safe and secure home is seen as a right, not a commodity to extract the highest price from. Mm -hmm. This particular report covers two elements. Um, one is to approve the full business case for the conditional assignment of a property lease from a registered provider of social housing um, uh, so that we can uh, bring it back uh, into use um, and house families in there, um, which is requires the release of £980,000 of capital funding um, and also sets out um, an update on the lease extension with the Hospital Trust for 24 units of accommodation uh, which we brought here previously and seeks delegated authority for the Exec Director for Growth and Regeneration to negotiate that extension. I commend the report to Cabinet. Uh, thank you Tom. Uh, so we have uh, received no public forum statements but we do, I'm pleased to say, on because there's a housing crisis in the city, you have at least one public forum question, and that's from yourself, Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, additional funding to tackle rough sleeping is to be welcomed by all, I'm sure, even perhaps those that would consider it to be a lifestyle choice. Under the Labour administration, the number of affordable homes being built in Bristol has hit a 20-year high. An outstanding statistic, considering government, COVID, the war in Ukraine and other economic shocks outside of our control. Can I ask you and the Cabinet member, how does the rate of empty council properties currently compare to other years throughout the past two decades. Tom. Thank you for the question, Councillor Pearce. So um, the, the last 20 years worth of data is published on the government website. The figure for this current year isn't up yet, but I'll go into that in a minute. Um, and we'll share the full table with you. But the one thing I would just point out is the last five years of those 20 are the lowest on record for the number of empty properties at, uh, in, in council housing stock owned by Bristol City Council. And for the current year, the provisional figure that has been shared with me um, is that there are currently 257 empty properties, will be, which will be the joint second lowest figure um, of the 20-year period. Of those 257, there are 58 that are currently ready to let and in the process of being let, which means the number of empty properties is currently about 199. Did you have a supplementary, Steve? I do, um, which may appear a little tangential, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Um, taking on, assuming a new tenancy, uh, taking on a, a void let, um, can be quite an expensive prospect for the new tenant. Uh, you might find yourself confronted with a few things that you need to buy for your new home that you weren't expecting. And we've all been confronted with higher energy costs. Now, while as a landlord, we can fix the envelope to make sure that it's as warm and cozy as we can, simple things like lined curtains can reduce energy bills by 10%. 
very easily. Is there some way that the council could work with city partners to ensure that we can help reduce people's energy bills at the point of letting? Because as I say, that's quite an ex perhaps the most expensive part of, of taking on a new tenancy. Did that make any sense at all? Yeah, sounds like something we should look at. Thank you. Thank you. I think, Steve, it um, probably be a good um, pitch to feed in as well, as you're talking about with city partners, because we obviously have a structure through which we can work with city partners, and that's the Homes Board that Tom's been co-chairing with uh, Una Goldsworthy. Um, but we also have that network of city leaders uh, from across public, private, voluntary sector and unions um, who meet regularly, who would have a collective interest in supporting the population. All right? When things go bad, they end up unwell, they end up like, physically, mentally unwell, we get a social breakdown, so um, you know, supporting people with a cost of living crisis by making our homes more efficient would be something, and obviously we have City Leap as well, so it might even be that there are some pretty low-tech interventions we can work up through City Leap. Kai, you've obviously had a handle on this, that we could explore with them and City Partners. An idea that occurs is that it might be as simple as lending someone a sewing machine to do the job themselves. Thank you. Uh, uh, any cabinet members wish to come before I come back to Tom Kai? Don? Yeah, thank, thank you. Just, yeah, just to come in on your question, Steve, um, there, there is advice out there. Um, I think the Centre for, St for Sustainable Energy um, provide um, advice and I think the, the West of England combined authority are paying for that so it's maybe something that we probably could advertise better to our tenants in terms of what's out there and um, obviously you've got we've got the City Leap pr program of, you've got 80 million pounds of, of investment coming forward over the next five years for our council house in stock obviously not not enough to go to um, every property we've got but to get it will be enough to get um, everything up to a at least an EPCC standard in ter terms of energy um, performance. And we are, there's other projects around the cost of living as well. So I, I think you were involved with this, weren't you, with, with um, Bristol Waste um, providing furniture from, you know, um, for, you know, from whatever, you know, can be reused rather than sending it to, um, uh, to, to landfill or wherever it ends up going. So um, they were working with um, people coming out of social care, weren't they? So... I think programs like that we can try and um, expand because I think that was quite a, quite a good little pro program for people coming into a property for a first time as well. Thank you, Kai. Uh, thanks, Steve, uh, for that. So, Tom, let me hand back. To, oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> Don. That's all, that's all right. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah. This at this point in the the electoral cycle, um, a, a councillor spends a lot of time. Uh, actually meeting the people out on the streets and uh, I welcome that part of the job actually I really enjoy it but um, and I agree that the emails are often dominated by a certain number of issues litter being one of them but interestingly in my ward certainly actually on the doors what people talk about is is housing you know I, I don't think not many people have actually said to me there's a problem of litter particularly they all point to the fact that there's three, four people at the door. One of them is their daughter or their son, and another one is a grandchild. Uh, someone said to me, there's eight people living in this flat. Um, how long will it take? And they don't actually ask about, about rent controls either, because they really like the, land, the council as a landlord. The council is really trusted as a landlord. I'm not saying... There's never a grumble about the repairs or something, but a lot of people, they don't want to buy their house or their flat. Um, they, they don't want to go to the private sector. They like living in a council house or a council flat, and they just want their kids to have a council flat, preferably in that area or council house, preferably in that area as well. And um, I like that attitude. Uh, there's certainly nothing at all wrong with it, and um, I, I can't wait till we've got a government that shares that attitude and respects that attitude for the first time in about in about 30 years. Uh, 
but um, we've, done, we've done some great work, and Tom, you've done some great work, and Gorham Holmes has done some great work in turning the corner on this, and um, yeah, I'm excited about what's going to happen in the next 10 years, not in the next few months, perhaps, but in the next 10 years. Thanks. Thank you very much, darling. I'll hand back to Tom, but I can't help but pick up on your point. I mean, there's a lot that's happened in the city over the years. If we had a government that was with us, <laughs> uh, it would have been incredible to have had that uh, tide of energy, uh, one that um, understood the priorities of a labor, labor local authority, but one that also understood the importance of local government uh, to delivery, right? And, and creating the conditions within which people can flourish. Uh, uh, but anyway, we, we got stuff done and hopefully there is something to come um, over the, the, the coming months in, uh, as a platform for the years ahead. Tom, let me hand back to you for final comments and take the decision, which I support. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> just as a final comment, you know, this is, this is why we're so focused on wanting to get more council homes built. Again, I've got a really ambitious programme around that, £946 million pounds for 3,082 council homes over the next five years, providing, you know, all the parties are behind those proposals um, after, after May and that we can get on with it and those things don't get blocked. Um, so in terms of decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you, Tom. And thank you for your question, Steve, and your comments, Kai and Don. So agenda item 11, safety valve programme, capital funding. Asher, you're going to bring this item. And as noted earlier, the chief exec and the monitoring officer have decided this item is urgent and cannot be reasonably delayed and have therefore exempted the call-in of the decision. Asha. Thank you. So in common with other local authorities, Bristol is experiencing rising numbers of children requesting statutory assessments, which translates to around 18, an 18% 18 rise in both assessment requests and EHCPs that are being maintained. Uh, that means we have 673 more children against a total of 4,382. And we're seeing a particular rise in secondary school uh, requests. So as a result of this rise, the DSG deficit uh, stands at 56.1 million cumulative as at the 24th of March, 2024. Which means if we do nothing, and the statutory override of DSG deficits isn't extended by the government, the council will be at risk of bankruptcy in 2026. Through the safety valve, the DFE will make available 53.8 million of DSG allocation payable over six years, which is only to be used to reduce the accumulated deficit on the DSG reserve. Of this amount, 40%, that's 21.5 million, has already been paid to the council, and that was received on the 31st of March. In addition, the council will contribute up to 46.5 million, including 42.7 million from reserves and 3.7 million from the general fund, which was approved through the 23-24 budget proposal process. The Safety Valve is a program which is about improving services and outcomes for children by both increasing specialist places in the short term, but also improving mainstream services, including schools for children so that they can stay supported in mainstream schools for as long as possible. We were invited, we were invited to enter the Safety Valve in July 2024 and told in August that uh, whilst we could tell elected members, we were not able to make any announcements about the invitation to develop a proposal. Our proposal was submitted in January after briefing subcommittees of audit committee, people committee chair, and finance task force. And in common with other local authorities, the cabinet paper uh, that came to uh, Cabinet last month was restricted ahead of a DFE announcement and was brought by APR 16 in order to gain agreement ahead of the pre-election period. In developing the plan, we have also been asked to submit a request for an additional 28.2 million 
for high needs capital allocation. The Cabinet paper makes a request to accept this preemptively and we are awaiting uh, an update on this capital amount from the DfE. The paper sets out the strands of work which will underpin the safety valve project uh, which brings together the SEND inclusion strategy and the DSG deficit management plan. The plan was developed building on the best practice from other local authorities who have demonstrated improved outcomes and managed DSG plans for high needs. It is therefore imperative that we continue to work closely with parents, carers and stakeholders in the development of this work and we will report regularly including on KPIs and progress to the SEND Partnership Board and to the future administration. I just wanted to add though that there's been a lot of hysteria and conspiracy theories swirling around what was said and what wasn't said and what was done around the safety valve, which I find quite laughable at best. But it's clear, uh, from, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, opposition parties not used to real polit political leadership are running scared. So I would suggest that any future administration who, are a, who wish to open discussions with the DfE about removing Bristol from the safety valve deal, but will need to do that, but be in a position to repay the deficit as well as meet the needs whilst making service improvements. Thank you. Thank you, um, Asha. So on this report, we've received one public forum statement. Um, and I'm just going to call name out Tara Waite. No. Okay. Turning to questions, we've had 10 public forum questions submitted uh, between six people. The first two questions are from uh, Jai Brinknauer. Is Jai Brinknauer here? Okay. Okay. So uh, would you like to ask your question? It's, it, I just want to say before I ask my question, it's a real shame that Councillor Asher Craig... It is a question, yeah. it's not a state. If you wanted a statement, you'd need to... So, if you wanted a statement, you'd need to submit a statement. So if we could say focus on the question, that'd be great. I just don't like my genuine trauma as a parent carer to be seen as laughable. In the safety valve report, it states the DfE requested secrecy in August 2023 and this is why Bristol Council did not undertake the usual democratic process. I have spoken to the DfE and they've told me that there was no embargo before, that there was no embargo before the agreement was signed in March 2024. They said that councils are free to discuss safety valve and undertake usual democratic process. And they advised me that Bristol's leaders either misunderstood or misappropriated the embargo advice. I would like to know which one it is and why. So in August 2023, after being invited to develop the safety valve bid, the DfE advised us in writing that whilst that they should inform elective members as part of the democratic process, we could not announce this work publicly. And this has been shared with the chair of OSM. The mayor has also had further conversations with the DfE today. Uh, and may be able to update further. Did you have a supplementary? Or did you want to go to your second question? Can I have an answer to my first question first, please? That's the answer. My second question is that the council announced safety valve will bring an additional 53.8 million of funding to send in Bristol, but the report makes it clear this funding can only be used to pay off the so-called deficit manufactured by the Tory government policies. Can the cabinet please admit that there is in fact no actual money coming from the government through safety valve to be spent on send education, just cuts that will put the council at risk of legal action as they won't be able to fulfill their duties under the Children and Families Act 2014 and other send regulations. 
So what I would say is that your question doesn't stand up to the reality of a ring fence budget in deficit. It's not a so-called deficit, it is a deficit. Under the safety valve agreement, 100.2 million, 100.2 million pounds of additional funding will be allocated to the Bristol Send education system. Of this, the DfE will provide 53.7 million and the council will provide an additional 46.5 million from our own resources. Together, these amounts represent additional Bristol Send education system funding over and above the allocation made available through the normal DSG. Of the 100.2 million additional funding, 56.1 million will be allocated towards the existing forecast historic deficit as at the 31st of March 2024 on the DSG grant reserve and the balance will be allocated to the future costs of the Bristol Send education system. Without this funding, there is no other way to recover the deficit, which could result in not just the DSG being bankrupt, but the whole council. It doesn't bear thinking about what the cons consequences would be for the people who rely on our services. However, if the future administration wants to leave the safety valve and send the money back, there's nothing to prevent them from doing so. Do you have a supplementary question? No, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, let's go on. We've had another question from a, from a Dan Ackroyd. No, okay, he's uh, not here. Okay, um, so um, I'll say a couple of things, but any other cabinet members wish to comment on this before I make final comments and hand it back to Asha? No, okay. So yeah, just as you uh, uh, just shared, Asha, I will, uh, you know, will confirm. I, I did actually talk to a senior civil servant at DfE this morning because um, I was concerned about this mismatch, as was told, uh, that uh, we have we had direct communications from DfE. Uh, both directly into our own uh, children's services, but also into our financial team, that this was not to be, this was embargoed and not to be in the public domain, particularly went through the negotiations of, uh, of getting onto the safety valve. Um, and then uh, a note coming out from an officer, from a, a civil servant saying that it could be public. Um, DfE admitted, have admitted that mistake. Um, in my conversation with the senior officer this morning at 10.30, uh, he acknowledged that th that a mistake had been made as well. Um, you know, from my point to him was that mistakes happen, but what you need to realise is that that mistake has caused a lot of heat uh, within the city and controversy, and has, uh, has led to a number of people taking that and accusing people of uh, lying and, and so forth, when that's not actually the case. He acknowledged that. Uh, what I uh, suggested to, to him is that they need to say something publicly, um, and while as a civil servant, they can't just turn something around like that in a day, I did suggest that they come back to me on Friday and say what they will do to, uh, to themselves, uh, acknowledge that a mistake uh, was made in the way they communicated uh, with us and then subsequently uh, with the public and that mismatch of information. Um, I also did uh, get clarification to, to make your point to him, I said there was some concern among some people within Bristol at uh, Bristol's participation in the safety valve, uh, both members of the public and councillors. Um, what he confirmed to me was that they will not compel Bristol to participate in the safety valve process. They would not and they cannot. If people are so concerned about the safety valve that they do not want Bristol to participate, if they do not think the money is real and they do not think that the, the, the financial crisis facing uh, 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 SEND services are real, uh, you can start planning now to withdraw Bristol from the safety valve process. Um, I would suggest that, uh, I think councillors are sworn in on the 5th of May, um, this is a live issue right now, councillors could get together this side of the election as opposition groups, plan, and be ready to take that decision on May the 6th, right? And if you wish for your councillors to withdraw Bristol from the safety valve process, you can talk to them this side of the election and make it one of the first decisions they make or press to make on May the 6th. Uh, but what I would urge you to do is to make sure 
that you are on top of the numbers uh, because the consequence of doing so is the reason why I support us being in a safety valve is because of the significant role it plays in, in our, on our financial uh, 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 standing and we do not want to end up like Birmingham and Nottingham. But I just want to reiterate, we have not locked this city into anything. So you can withdraw and you can plan to withdraw and it, but it would probably be good to know if you plan to withdraw this side of the election so the public can uh, take that into account as they're making the decisions um, in, the, uh, in, in who they think will manage the council's finances uh, responsibly. Okay, so um, Asha, let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. Yeah, I just wonder, uh, again, I, I think... Um Unless there's another pot of money out there, unless there's another pot of gold out there that the government or somebody else has made available, there is nothing else other than this. So it's not as if everybody has not been aware of what the situation is in relation to SEND and the, high, uh, and the DSG and the growing needs in this city. So, but I have never been approached by opposition or anybody else who's come up with any other suitable idea of where we are going to get the money from to address the growing deficit. And the deficit will only continue to grow if we don't get on top of it. So, um, sorry. <laughs> In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve. <laughs> The recommendations are set out in the report. Thank you. Thanks, Asha. Um, so, agenda item 12. Craig, this is with you. Uh, TIPCO uh, maintenance contract. It's the one we've all been waiting for, I know. Um, TIP TIPCO integration software is a digital platform that supports integration between different IT systems used across the council. The current contract expires in June, in June and the re-procurement of a compliant maintenance contract for three years is required to ensure continuity of system integration. This will support the standardization of processes, enhancing communication and optimize resource whilst delivering better customer service across all of our channels. Please recommend it to Cabinet. Uh, thank you, Craig. So uh, we've received no public forum statements uh, on this uh, question. Any Cabinet members wish to comment? Did I see your hand move there, Don, to uh, comment on the TIPCO maintenance contract? No, okay. <laughs> Uh, we joke, but again, Craig, this is some of the stuff that happens behind the scenes that's absolutely essential to this, you know, the smooth running of this local authority, and we never appreciate it until it disappears, right? Uh, so, yeah, thank you for your um, hard yards on this, as I've said over the years. Uh, let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support uh, and uh, will be displayed on the screen. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that, so firstly, having a democratic process means bringing these things to Cabinet, whether or not they're the most enthralling papers is, is something. The other is that without them, a lot of the basic things that we assume the council can do, it won't be able to do. So, and people will only notice when that stops. Um, in terms of the decisions we made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you, uh, Craig. Uh, so, agenda item 13, hybrid meeting technology and audio visual upgrades. Yeah, I mean, everyone who reads this paper will understand that um, the, world is, the world of work has changed and people are expecting, requiring, and should be able to work in different ways, be that from, you know, due to childcare, working from home, be that through, um, well, any, any number of reasons why they may, they may seek to work differently than they do today. Um, through this paper, we're seeking approval to provide fit-for-purpose facilities that enable efficient and effective hybrid working. The project includes provision of an automated webcasting and hybrid meeting solution in the council chamber, which improves equity of act access and transparency of democratic meetings. Alongside this, we're seeking to install new hybrid meeting technology and audio-visual equipment for City Hall and the incident room in 100 Temple Street. This is a vital investment as we prepare council facilities for the future. Even today, one of our projection screens is clearly not working, which only probably highlights the, where we're at with the problem. Uh, I'm pleased to recommend this to the Cabinet. Thank you, uh, Craig. Uh, we have uh, actually um, had a public forum statement. And Dave, you, 
Um, so that's for, from yourself, Dave, from Bristol uh, Disability yeah. Equalities Forum. So, Dave, you have a minute. Uh, you have a question after this as well, so you will be so, able to so pick this up. Is, this is on behalf of the forum and, and South Gloucestershire's equivalent forum. I mean, um, there are members of um, Bristol Disability Equalities uh, Forum and South Gloucestershire Equalities Network that would like to join these meetings and put their, their questions and their statements. And... The strange thing is, in one part of the city region, they can, they can dial in and they can speak to Councillor, um, um, uh, uh, sorry, the leader of um, South Gloucestershire Council, <coughs> Ian Bolton and Claire Young, about issues concerning parts of the city region. <coughs> but they can't dial in to Bristol, so they can't put questions from Westbury on Trim or Brislington. <coughs> or parts of the city um, and that is something we really think should be addressed uh, other southwest councils Gloucestershire Wilkeshire Don in his role as chair of the Western Gateway Transport Board has dial-in facilities and we do at the Bristol Transport Board itself we need to open up democracy make democracy accountable to the people of Bristol and the city region the mayor of the west of England could learn as well he's got technological equipment he doesn't use it um, and we need to make sure that we open up democracy so all I'm asking really is can we look at this under the new administration can we move forward with the rest of the southwest councils I can even zoom into Yeovil Town Council but I can't zoom in and put a question as able person to this council thank you uh, David um Am I going to? I'm going to take it that your statement merged into your question there because you put the question at the end. Yeah, okay. Uh, no problem. Okay, so I'm going to take that that that, that as your question as well. Um, so, uh, Craig. Yeah, I mean, so uh, the the quick answer is that yes, this technology will enable you to do that. Um, the uh, the in terms of an exact date when you'll be able to do it, which is in your question, I don't think we have that yet. This is just pressing the start button on beginning the procurement process and then the, you know the project will then run and install it so I don't think we can give you an exact date of when it will happen but this technology should allow you to do that and to join those councils where you can zoom into meetings and ask your questions from afar. Do you have a supplementary uh, Dave? I suppose can we just ask that the four political parties plus the West of England Mayor can buy authority in North Somerset actually look at this in their in their first um, their first council meetings uh, and their policy committee meetings to make sure this happens because only Jacob Rees-Mogg appears not to like Zoom and um, modern technology in the council chamber and in Parliament. Um, we need to move in, as a capital of the South West in a democratic process so that's all I ask. Can the Chief Executive please pick this up? It's been a long time coming. The screen should be in this room. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, David. I mean, officers will be recommending that to the next administration, so I'm sure they'll, they will introduce it. Um, I'm sure Jacob Rees-Mogg don't want to do it in case it catches him asleep at his, in his chair again. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll just say something on this a minute, but uh, we've had uh, no other um, engagement on this item, but are there any cabinet members wish to comment before I go back to Craig? Now, I'll just say something that, as you, as you talk about this, Dave, I'll, um, I'll, I'll raise this. I think um, it, we want the public debate in the city to be fully informed. And, and, it, and it reminds me of um, uh, uh, David Olasuga's documentary after uh, uh, the following us a year after statue, where people got to see actually how politics really worked uh, within the city quite often, dealing with complex issues. Too often when complexity is not necessarily at the forefront, it's a bit of a crash bang wallop, can I get a click out of this? So uh, I, I'm sure that actually with the, it, it, you know, the, the technology that will be available uh, through this, that councillors would welcome the opportunity, particularly going into the new um, era, to put as many meetings as, as possible in the public. I'm sure, I'm sure we would love to, to, to be talking through in public uh, the many decisions we made. Uh, actually, so I, I hope this will increase that capacity, I, and I think certainly as the the new system comes about, being able to see inside that system and how it works and and how positions are distributed would be would be a fantastic opportunity. 
Um, I understand, though, they would have to be public meetings, but um, those, those can be defined as public meetings in all those early negotiations. Uh, so, I, 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 you know, I, I think, I think for, for, as your specific intervention around disabled people um, is, uh, you know, of critical importance, and we agree with that, and we did do this during COVID, there is a broader opportunity that comes from uh, the advances as well. We just have to be careful as well and to be on top of all the security on systems like that, because we have seen people hack in and, you know, and abuse them in the past as well, which, again, which is some of the work that Craig and the team do behind the scenes of Richard Rann, our own cybersecurity is so critical. So it's not, it's not a development without risk, uh, but nonetheless a development that uh, you know, would be welcome to, to give people access to actually how decisions are really made and the trade-offs that we, we work with all the time. So I really appreciate you um, uh, raising that, uh, that question, Dave. I'd also say actually it'd be really important at combined authority level as well. When I've shared a number of times that one of the things we're gonna have to come to grips with as a region is that Bristol is the city with the city challenges and Bristol is then trying to work out how it works with the combined authority, but within a combined authority that is essentially surrounded by quite rural areas. And sometimes the, the priorities that we've brought to the combined authority are competing with what we would see as uh, rural priorities, like bus routes to villages. Now that doesn't mean that those aren't important, they are but it does mean that we're in a combined authority that's comp competing for a, a finite pot of money in which sometimes the urban interest can be competed against or put on a, as, 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 a, as against a rural um, interest. And, and uh, seeing how those negotiations take place and how decisions are made, uh, you know, I, I think could be incredibly important and, and really useful uh, to people across the patch. So, you know, thank you for your, um, you know, intervention. Well, there wasn't anything else. So, Craig, let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Uh, thank you, Craig. We're staying with you for um, item 14, procurement of a legal dynamic purchasing system and external legal services. That's another thrilling one. Um, Bristol City Council has a current contract in place with Constellia dating from 2023. We are now seeking to procure and enter into a dynamic purchasing system for legal services in partnership with Constellia and subsequently procure external legal services to the value of 5.7 million over a five year period. If agreed, the Council's legal service would act as contracting authority for the purposes of PCRs and procure, and procure external legal services where it could not be met by the in house legal team. This includes specialist areas they don't cover, large and complex projects where we don't have capacity, and litigations require legal opinions and representation of the council. Under DPS agreements, the contracting authority usually receives a rebate, usually a percentage of the fees included under the DPS. This would generate income for the council. It's anticipated that a considerable volume of legal services will be provided due to the low number of legal services DPS schemes in the market and because COGS legal services act as an attractive proposition for bodies wishing to minimise spend. It's anticipated that Constellia will be responsible for management and marketing the DPS to the wider public sector, ensuring increased use of the DPS and generating additional revenue for the Council. It, it's expected that external legal services required from April 24 to the date the DPS is established will be in the region of 900k, and that during the first four years of the DPS operating, legal advice required will be in the region of 4.8 million. I'm pleased to recommend this to Cabinet. Thank you, Craig. Um, we've received no public forum statements or questions. Um, on this item. Any cabinet members wish to comment? Okay, thank you. Uh, so Craig, let me hand back to you to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. Uh, in terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you, Craig. Uh, so on to agenda item 16, uh, community meal service contracts. Probably worth saying Helen Holland, this is a bit of a champion of our community meal services, but would love to have uh, been here, but this is, uh, this is with you, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Marvin. I'm presenting this one on behalf of Helen. Can I just say this, is, this will be my last ever cabinet paper. I've been here for almost all of the 99 meetings we've ever had. Um, <laughs> it's quite an exciting moment for me. It's not even my own cabinet paper. Um, but also, also, just to say on behalf of cabinet, Marvin, a massive thank you for all you've done for Bristol over the past eight years. Yeah. Um, I know that it's not, even, even as Deputy Mayor, the levels of kind of scrutiny and um, impl implications, the... Uh, accusations and the unfair criticism that you receive is 
is and the abuse and outright abuse here yeah, is an incredibly difficult thing that's hurtful to you and to your family and I know it has been to, our, to us and ours as well um, and so just a, a massive thank you for kind of staying on straight and narrow for all of that despite how difficult it's been um, and so thank you so on to the paper community meals service the community meal service delivers a hot meal and well-being check to customers daily the current contract for the supply of meals will come to an end in September so a new contract is required this new contract will start on the 1st of October to ensure there is no break in service delivery and to minimise the impact on customers. The continuum of this service aligns with our public health approach to achieve health and wellbeing equality by increasing access to diverse, nutritious meals to support people to stay healthier and happier throughout their lives. It's, it's a service, so my next door neighbour used to receive community meals, and um, aside from conversations with us and, and the neighbours on the other side, it was probably the only conversation that he had every day. And they would knock on the door, say hello, give him his food, have a little chat, and spend a little bit of time just checking in with him every day. And I know f from hearing the conversation th that he would have that it just brought a little bit of something into, into his day. Um, and that can't be underestimated. It's a service that we don't have to provide, but we're continuing to provide because we can see the value of that. It's also a service that would be easy to outsource and again we've we've not done that because uh, again we, th we think that the council officers are providing that extra bit of um, reach that, that a private provider probably wouldn't provide and, and, we, and we would have to pay for actually and that we don't need to in this in this in our own system so um, it's a really important thing it doesn't sound very exciting but it's huge for some people in the city and I'm really proud that we're we're sticking with it and I know Helen is too uh, thank you, Craig. Uh, so on this uh, report, we've received one public forum statement, and that's from uh, Lisa Durston, who I believe isn't here. Um, so short of that, can I ask any cabinet members who may wish to comment on this item? Oh, um, Ellie. Hi, yeah, I just want to really welcome this paper. I know um, Helen has worked really hard to ensure that this stays in-house. It wasn't always proposed that it was going to be. Um, and it is obviously, it's not just a warm meal being delivered to people's doors, but it's it's a, it's another welfare check. It's a it's a friendly face that's checking in on some of our most vulnerable residents, just to make sure that they're okay and um, giving them a friendly face and um, just that, that few minutes of support that um, that really makes sure that we just look after people and go the extra mile to make sure that they're taken care of. So I really I really welcome it. And could I also just um, take the opportunity again to thank you Marvin for your eight years of service to the city um, as a woman in your cabinet I want to thank you for your support to me personally um, you've always been very collaborative very supportive and taking the time to make sure that um, I feel supported so I just wanted to thank you personally for that and uh, for all your hard work and there's so much behind the scenes that people don't see um, a lot of the young people that come up through your office and, and had fantastic time there learning uh, seeing the city through through the eyes of of local leadership um and and gone on to do great things so it's just been it's a, an absolute privilege to have served in your cabinet thank you for your service to the city okay um any other cabinet members wish to comment don yeah thank you it, it was a brave a decision of Helen's to to keep this to keep this in house, and I think it's um, it's difficult to pin down sometimes what the value of having um, things in house is. It's not as tangible as perhaps we would like, but it's having a sense of ownership, I guess, about a service that you don't quite get when you have that transactional relationship with a provider and it points to the nature of what a council is as well as um, a democratically elected group of people who come out of the community represent their areas and actually um, the council is us this council is Bristol and to be able to say that um, people who are vulnerable by by virtue of being elderly um, someone from the city from your organization goes checks on them and makes and takes some food rather than just a company um it's, it shows accountability and it shows responsibility in that and that, and that's something i think that we've certainly put it in our manifesto that we want to exploit that 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 kind of non-transactional but sense of ownership relationship within the council 
um, in, in highways maintenance. There are areas of our maintenance work which I believe would be better handled by us as an organisation directly. And I can certainly see in our public transport, and this is going to need uh, a direction from central government, which I hope will come, but we are most definitely not going to have the transport system that we all, public transport system, that we all aspire to and our economy needs um, on a purely commercial basis. We are going to have to have something that we have that ownership of and we direct for reasons of values other than just what, how much money it makes for somebody else particularly. It has to stack up, but there are other things we want from a public transport system, social and economic benefits, and we need some big changes in, in the government and we here are ready to respond to those and we recognise how those changes could benefit us as a city and waiting to get going on it. Thanks, Don. Um, so I'm going to hand back now uh, to, uh, uh, to take the decision uh, which, which uh, I approve of. You'll be doing this on behalf of um, Helen Craig. It's just worth, to, again, just to... As, as you said, just to throw some light back on um, Helen for the incredible work she's done uh, in this area. And it's uh, it, it, you're really taken by the fact that um, one is a source of incredible pride uh, in her for what's, her pride for what, what we've done, which is a good pride. Uh, but also it is about the end users, but it's also about the workforce she's talked to. And I've been to visit the centre a couple of times and the level of pride and engagement and actually the community among the team uh, that are involved in this and the community that they create amongst themselves that extends out into the people they take meals to and engage with and talk with is actually uh, quite incredible. And if you if you never had a chance, I did have, have the chance to go out with them on some of the rounds as well and just, again, see just how welcome they are. As you said, Craig, you know, human contact and a time when we recognise increasingly that I, I, loneliness and isolation is amongst the biggest health threats we have uh, to our population at this moment in time. So... Uh, you know, it, it's nice to have this as a final paper from Helen on your behalf, um, of, from you on, Hel um, on Helen's behalf, whichever way around it goes, uh, uh, you know, at the end of an incredible 30 plus years of service uh, she's given uh, to Bristol. Uh, so let me hand back to you now, Craig, to take the decision which I support and which will be displayed on the screen. Yeah, thanks, Marvin. I'll just reiterate that. Thanks to Helen for 30 plus years of service to Bristol City Council. It's a shame she can't be here today, but... Um a huge thanks from all of us and she's been she was the labor group leader when i was first elected way back when um and she's been you know very supportive of me from the beginning and um i don't know where the city would be without her so thank you helen for everything in terms of the decisions to be made today i approve the recommendations i set out in the report thank you craig and agenda item 17 uh bristol's anti-racism in education engagement report and Asha, this is uh, your paper. Okay, the final report of uh, our administration. And uh, so let me go straight into it. So the Anti-Racism in Education Engagement Report sets out the vision, mission, and key work streams that will positively impact all children and young people, providing a roadmap to complete a co-produced strategy with professionals, leaders, families, and educators, and of course, children and young people with lived experience. Nationally, only 1.1% of black Caribbean teachers make up the teacher workforce in comparison to 85.1% of white Brit British teachers. The data becomes even more stark when nationally, 92.5% of head teachers are white British in comparison to 0.7% of head teachers identifying as black Caribbean. The local picture is just as stark. Children and young people of Bristol are the next generation of change makers and the anti-racism in education engagement report was born from their voices and feedback right here in this room at City Hall in 2023. The report formalizes strategic work that is being driven by the service areas in education and in the education and skills directorate. 
The voices of black and minoritized young people are clear, articulate, and passionate about the experiences they are having and what they would like to see changing for the future in their educational journeys. They want to feel that their voices are heard, that they are valued, and that they belong in their setting and in their city. They want to see themselves represented in the leadership of their provision and that all of their teachers know, respect, and value them as young individuals, which is not for many their experience, which is demonstrated and clearly visible through the data that highlights uh, disproportionality and overrepresentation. Educational inequality is a huge issue for our city. Despite having two world-class universities based here, in South Bristol, the participation in higher education is only 22.3%, including three of the five lowest performing areas in the UK. Hartcliffe at 8.7%, which is the lowest in England, High Ridge and Withywood. There are also entrenched racial inequalities in Bristol across institutions and society. I'm proud of the work that this administration has done on racial justice across all sectors, but this report sets out the evidence of need to look into the future of those that will take forward further work in educational settings. We need Bristol and education educators to purposely consider anti-racism in our thinking, our actions and decision-making in education provision across the city so that we can see improved outcomes for black and minoritized pupils. Bristol City Council must emphatically learn and better understand the experiences of black and minoritized people, recognizing our experiences and our impact, which is unique to different communities. So I don't want to kind of labor the, the, the point, but I think there are five key areas that I do want to point out that the, the, the report is going to be focusing on. The first area is ensuring that we close the attainment gaps for black and minoritized groups and disadvantaged children here in the city. We need to reduce exclusions and increase in attendance. Uh, we also need to improve representation of black and minoritized leaders across the city uh, in, in our educational establishments. We also need to eradicate the disproportionality that we are finding in the SEND process. And we also need to create a bespoke professional development program for the workforces in schools and settings. Work has already started to drive systemic make change, but more needs to be done. So I commend this report to the new administration to take forward this work and to take this work extremely seriously. Uh, because as I said, we are responding to the voices of children and young people here in our city. Thank you. Yeah, well, we, we did have a discussion on education years, but we've had no public forum uh, statements on Bristol's anti-racism in education engagement reports, no uh, questions. Uh, but can I ask if any cabinet members would like to comment on this item? No, I mean, I, I will very briefly, if I'm not blinded by the sun. Um, I mean, it's just hugely important. I'm really proud of everything that we've done th through this administration, um, but I'm, I'm mostly proud of the work that we've done in, in this area, and, and particularly of what you've done, Asher, because I know it's, it was something that um, you were passionate about continue to be passionate about it, but were when we were first elected back in the day so um yeah just to say a massive thank you to you for what you've done on this and i know that bristol will be in an improved place because of it thank you i think the for me what's really important <coughs> is that um the journey that the city has been on that journey needs to um continue i know that there are a lot of people in my community that are highly concerned that the organization will go backwards and will kind of um, throw out a lot of the good work that we have done in trying to address all inequalities, whether that's disability, race, uh, on gender, um, uh, LGBTQ+, you know, we've, we've made some great strides here in this city. So it's really important that we don't turn back 
the hand of time. Uh, we've, the, the new administration has to kind of keep driving uh, this work. And we, it would just be so disappointing because the young people have spoken. And I've always made it clear, particularly in this cabinet role, that the, 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 um, uh, we need to take young people seriously, <laughs> right? They're, you know, it's their future. We have a belonging strategy. Uh, we need to walk our talk. And so let, hopefully um, th this work, uh, and I know this work and the commitment is there, particularly from the officers. I'm just hoping that the new administration, um, if it's our party, I have no, I'm not stressed, <laughs> but I do worry, I'm, trust me. And I'm not the only one worrying in the city. All, the, all of our, our kids are worrying as well as their families. So, yeah. Ellie. Yeah, I just want <clears throat> to thank Asha for the <laughs> enormous amount of work she's done in pushing this agenda on in the city. Um, I was fortunate enough to be on the uh, the race, Bristol Race and Health Equity group, the last one that Asha chaired, which was a group that was born out of COVID. Um, but again, if if you could see the the city leaders, the way that they talked about Asha's leadership in this area, it was a, it's, it's significant, and it's something that the next administration cannot afford to back to go backwards on. So we have to keep that laser like lens on it, and I think that has been felt very much um, filtered through every part of this um, um, uh, council through y yourself, Marvin and Asha, and the, and the leadership that you've shown in this area. Um, so it is on us to absolutely carry forward that legacy um, and there's some fantastic um, recommendations in this and even taking my own eldest kid uh, to visit high schools and seeing one of them hold the belonging strategy as their main um, theme as what they were trying to get kids into the school with and they, they brought kids onto the stage to talk about what that meant to them and how they felt it was this inclusive family regardless of background, regardless of opportunity, regardless of where they came from. Um, and to see that um, filter through to one of our schools, I thought was um, quite a moving moment for me and I just thought of you immediately. So thank you so much for all you've done in the city. Oh, do you want to? <laughs> I mean, here, here, as far as, you know, what Ellie's just said, you, you know, should I be leading the council post-May, then you have my full commitment that they will continue to drive this agenda forward and keep it front and centre. Uh, I'll hand back to you in a sec, but I, what I would say as well, um, Asha, you know, a couple of things. I think there's a very superficial understanding of race and race inequality. Uh, that is about, can we all be nice to each other, maybe eat some ethnic food every now and again and... You know, and it's not that, it's, it's, it's a lot more sophisticated than that. It's the thing that Martin Luther King often talked about, superficial analysis versus deeper understanding, systemic uh, problems. It's not always about hostile individuals. You can have people who are properly right on politically, but they oversee organizations and systems that, can, that, that systemically churn out inequality. And that's much harder uh, to get a hold of. And I know that's what you, and by extension, we, uh, and this administration has been about. So thank you for your leadership, you know, on that. Uh, the, the second thing I would just point to is when we think about, you know, the, the challenges of Colston, the era, um, and the, the years after that, I mean, and obviously, you know, race didn't become an issue <laughs> in that moment. We're dealing with it from the very beginning. But let's throw ahead then to that gathering we had on the top floor of the M Shed at the launch of the Bristol Legacy Foundation. And I've told so many people about this. For the city to go on a journey where it just has the ability to talk about race in a, in a mature way, right? Not, and I remember back to 2007, people getting very sensitive about it, scared of it and all the rest of it. Talking about race, talking about its interaction with class, talking about its, its, its relationship with the ongoing inequalities within Bristol, to have that conversation and get to a point where over at the M Shed, we've got yourself, we've got people like uh, Jendai zooming in, uh, Jendai Sirwell, we've got Madhu Ellis, uh, we've got elders from the community with Master of the Merchant Ventures, head of the University of Bristol, business community, sitting in a room of people from all different backgrounds, uh, having a conversation in which we're being real about Bristol's history, 
real about Bristol's present and real about doing the hard yards of how we create a city within which within this 42 square miles, we continue to live together in the face of challenges that are coming uh, down the track is no small achievement. It's to create the conditions in which we can have that conversation is a, is a huge achievement and will not go away because it's not just down to the council, it's down to all the other institutions uh, with whom we collectively create the raw material uh, that is Bristol. Um, and I think that those organisations that have been given a space to come into that conversation in a way uh, when they've been perhaps looking for a way in or hiding from it because they didn't know the way in and were scared to come in, the fact that now they've, been, they, they've had space and a runway to get involved has been uh, you know, one of those contributions to the city that perhaps doesn't go fully appreciated by people who are not so you're thinking about this, but is very appreciated by people from the community and other institutions in Bristol, and certainly from people outside Bristol uh, looking in. So just thank you for your leadership on that. Let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. And before I make the decision, I'm going to... <laughs> um, yeah, this is going to be the, my last meeting uh, as, uh, as well, alongside um, my co-conspirator, <laughs> uh, my Deputy Mayor Craig, yourself, um, who I'm, I'm leaving behind, uh, hopefully, uh, Kai, Don, uh, Marley, um, Tom, and Ellie. <laughs> Sorry, am I getting emotional? Why am I getting emotional? Um, I didn't think I would, but um, I just wanted to make one point. We have, as a city, been on a journey when it comes to race. It has been extremely uncomfortable. Uh, not necessarily for me, because it's not my issue, you know. Uh, but um, it has been uncomfortable at times for many people that who have had and continue to have this conversation. But I also want to applaud all of those organizations, institutions, and individuals, including our own chief exec, Stephen Peacock, who is actually our race champion and has been driving and leading the work on strategic race equality here in this, in, in this city. So I wanna commend people like Stephen and I want to commend all of those leaders who have, yeah, faced this issue um, head on, as, a, as uncomfortable as it can be. But I think, as I've said before, it would be a travesty if we did not follow through and make sure that every child in this city, including black and minoritized young people, um, you know, not only feel that they belong, but they also get the same shot uh, as everybody else does in this city. It can't be right that only 8% of children and young people in Hartcliffe go to university compared with something like is it 97% in Clifton? It's crazy. It's crazy. So we all as a city, uh, and this isn't just on the council alone, it's everybody um, needs to kind of pull together and kind of drive the change that uh, our children deserve and this city really needs. So on that note, um, yeah, I commend this report to everyone and um, in terms of the decision to be made today, I approve, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you, um, Asha. So uh, that's the end of today's cabinet meeting. Thank you, everyone, for attending.